the vignettes. And tonight we are going to do uh, an episode on savior general generals, generals that uh, leaders, military leaders that James and I think are worth mentioning that come to mind when we think of uh, these type of heroes, and that's what they are, who save their civilization or their people uh, from destruction or from uh, horrible loss and who basically uh, don't don't get the credit they deserved and come to be despised by their own people, which is quite tragic, but unfortunately is part of the, uh, the history of, of civilization, apparently. Um, before we do that, though, I wanted to address some questions that I got from the audience and the listenership. And uh, by the way, I'm perfectly uh, open and willing and, and, and like to have feedback, of course, and James is too. And so since me and James are doing multiple episodes together and who knows how long this will go, but hopefully it'll keep on going. Um, I think that it's worthwhile now since we've done a few episodes to, to try to address some of these questions. And James, one of the questions was uh, specifically with uh, your and I, if I'm if I mess misphrase this, please correct me. But essentially you were talking about the type of people and the amount of people that are capable of sustained violence. And, you know, basically it appears that if at most uh, roughly 30 percent of people can, you know, um, be competent in um, inflicting violence upon somebody else. Is that correct by your by your estimation, roughly 30 percent? Okay, so that information came from Lieutenant David Grossman's book, On Killing, and there were various studies that pegged this 30% for agrarian and industrial American men. Okay? And this was a huge problem. The U.S. military uh, was very worried about the fact that most of their men were not trying to kill the enemy. However, the U.S. military was killing more enemies than it ever had killed before. Eventually, um, they managed through various uh, methods to train people. I remember my brother telling me they used to sing songs about when he was in the 82nd Airborne about shooting pregnant women. Different things they do to dehumanize you. Uh, instead of just showing you the techniques, they try to warp your brain uh, to get you to kill people. And in Vietnam, they got a whole lot of Americans that weren't really cut out to kill people, to kill people. And... It's one of the biggest and most accurate tropes about uh, recent American history is that men that served in the Vietnam War came back uh, hugely scarred, suffering from PTSD. And the PTSD was not something that was documented by the ancients, and it did not really have a place in folklore or military thinking prior to the Industrial Age. Okay, We, we could talk about some of that later, but the uh, uh, first of all, that's we're not talking about one third of people today under U.S. military circumstances. They will get you to shoot at somebody. Most people, they developed methods. We're talking about the men fighting between the Civil War and uh, the Korean War. They even improved things a little bit more in the Korean War. They started developing these techniques and they improved it a lot by the time of the Vietnam War. And it caused grave psychological issues among men. Now, in the current military, most U.S. military personnel will never, in combat, be called upon to aim a weapon and fire at another person. This is only engaged in by a very small number of special operations uh, infantry marines. Okay, that's it. These are very special people. They're pre-selected, and then they're trained on top of that, and you pretty much got 100%. Yeah, they're going to go kill somebody, okay, even if they know that's a person. Now, one of the things that was seen is during uh, uh, people fighting in vehicles, tankers and plane uh, pilots would kill their enemy at a much higher rate than infantrymen because they're not looking at another human being. They're looking at a machine that has monstrous qualities to it, and they're not seeing a person. Okay, that, So that was one of the things. Uh, if we want to look at the Great Revolution in killing, the, uh, uh, this begins in World War I 
with crew-served weapons. Between World War I and World War II, the percentage of people killed with handheld weapons aimed by individuals was no higher than 2% and as low as 1%. 98 to 99% of people killed in World War II were killed by crew-served weapon weapons. In World War II, predominantly indirect fire weapons like artillery. In World War I, predominantly direct fire weapons like machines. And with a crew-served weapon, you are engaged in teamwork. You are very busy with the technical challenges of not letting your buddies down, running ammunition through this thing, and covering a certain area. It's very impersonal. The German machine gunners who killed millions of people in World War One were they were they might as well have been operating a sewing machine and they didn't often even see the people that they were killing because these weapons were now starting to get a great range. What the US military was worried about was the type of situation that they almost had to deal with in Japan. They did not invade Japan uh, because they nuked it. Uh, but the battles leading up to the invasion of the home islands and the Pacific Islands were very nasty. Okay, we're taking a, a lot of psychological toll upon the combatants. Upon the combatants, the men really resisted having to do so much killing at such close range against recognizable human beings. Okay, in a jungle environment, the U.S. military knew that with the Cold War. Uh, with the Soviets being the big enemy, where you're going to see a lot of combat was once again going to be in the insurgency, the light infantry, small unit tactics, something more like the Civil War, something more like Indian Wars, something where you're going to have a small group of people firing a small group of people. So they were really frantic to prepare for something like Vietnam, which they knew was going to happen somewhere, somehow, and uh, get their men uh, brainwash at a point where most men picked at random. Remember, these are not selected Navy SEALs or special ops guys. No, these are just regular guys that are drafted. But they got most of them to point their guns at other human beings but they and, and shoot them. And then it melted their brains. They had very uh, basically the uh, American experience with disaster at opiate addiction begins right here, okay, uh, with the Vietnam War. Now, but where the most killing happens in war, in the war's understudy, and the war that uh, this Marshall study was conducted about, where there's an exit, uh, exit interviews of men that were being discharged, and they asked them a battery of questions about, you know, uh, about what went down. Uh, I've read a couple of dozen biographies of people who fought in this war. The best one, well, there's company commander, is very good. Uh, the Long Walk was good by a Polish guy that got captured by the Russians. Uh, I'd have to say that the best one would be Iron Cross Sniper on the Eastern Front. The sniper has an intimate relationship with his target. He knows he's killing a person. He can see them. Okay, uh, He can tell a lot of details about them. Uh, 15 to 17 million Russians were killed during this war, mostly by crew-served weapons. The combat that the uh, this German sniper, I forget his name, he ended up being a vice president for American Steel Company, described with, uh, and we're not talking about dying, we're talking about killing. You had millions of Russians killed. Not millions of Russians killing people, millions of Russians killed. The, the, uh, the Russians would unleash days of artillery. Okay. And then they would unleash their troops and their tanks. Now, the troops were herded into combat by commissars who were armed with submachine guns. And this German sniper, in his regiment, which was by the time they got into Hungary, was reduced to like platoon size. He did most of the killing. He's paired up with a couple hundred guys, which become a couple dozen guys. Throughout the whole march back from the Battle of Kursk, all the way back to uh, Germany and the outskirts of Berlin, he does most of the killing in that unit. He is the sniper. He's got the best shot. He can reach out and touch people from farther away, and uh, he's very good at it. Most of the men just supply his logistics. They just make sure that he's not going to get overrun because the Russians that he's picking off know 
that if they just break across the field and run at him, it's not just him. He might be the only one shooting at them from a distance. But there's a bunch of other guys that they will be attacking if they attack him. And those guys will fire to defend themselves, even though they're not accurate at the range he is accurate at. Furthermore, these Russian troops are being herded like sheep through these funnels. He's, just, he's killing so many of them, it's making them sick. Uh, because if they turn around or if they even slow down, they get machine gunned from behind by the commissars, by the Communist Party uh, enforcers of the offensive. Uh, on the American front, the, uh, uh, the war in Italy uh, gives you, and uh, in France gives you two examples. One in France, you have Aldi Murphy. Basically wipes out a German battalion by himself. He wasn't by himself. He was the only guy firing the weapons. He's running around firing all the weapons. Everybody else was shell shot, which is, or combat fatigue, which is what they were calling it then. Now, after he became famous for doing this, basically uses many of the weapons in, of his unit, which other men in his unit are not using, and he wipes out this whole German unit. Uh, they end up pulling him out of the line because they want to save him. They want to use him as war hero. He ends up having a movie career. He has a high level of drug addiction, okay, and does not end up dying a happy man. He's extremely miserable his whole life. He knew how to kill. The mechanics were in him. He was a squirrel hunter when he was a kid. But then after killing many human beings, you know, it scarred him for life. Now, the uh, one thing, the, aside from crew-served weapons, indirect fire weapons and uh, firing at machines that are filled with people, but you don't see the people. Aside from that causing increased casualties over previous wars when guys would run up to each other with their bayonets and then not stick them in and then one side would run away. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I, I heard that it's like, even from like the, when we have records going back hundreds of years of bayonet charges, it's like people will not do, will not face up to bayonet charges. Some, some got some nuts do. <laughs> now the French, well, all the it. nuts in the ancient world did, you right. know, yeah, well, we'll get, yeah, yeah. But these are pre-selected people. Yeah, this isn't everybody. See what. Yeah. When you're asking me about everybody on the street or everybody yeah, they, in America, uh, yes. this is where industrial conscript armies come from. Exactly. This is where drafted armies come from. It's everybody. In the ancient world, you're like, okay, who can fight? Mm -hmm. Well, whoever doesn't step forward, okay, keep farming, get the food to us. We're going to yeah. kill people. Okay, so that's uh, th that's a whole different thing. These are pre-selected people. Now, yeah. the, uh, th th this other aspect in World War II particularly in the Pacific and anywhere where the Germans fought. The Germans inflicted three to one losses everywhere. And the Japanese suffered massive losses everywhere. The same, one of the same things was driving us. One, they were highly trained. Uh, so many of them were recruited. They were not all fanatical. You'd have some of those who were fanatical. You did not want to be messing with the Japanese Imperial Marines. Or the Waffen SS. I mean, these guys really believe what they were doing. Even regular line units are much more deadly than historically hi hi history predicts they should be. One of the aspects is pervitin, which we now call crystal meth. These dudes were all drugged up. Uh, yeah. The the German army on the drive uh, through the Ardennes in 1940, these guys didn't sleep for like five days. <laughs> they're just popping perfect then they're keeping going okay and they were hopped up they wanted to go all the way to the sea and cut the you know really finish the guys at dunkirk but you uh uh Goering, uh talked uh hitler into ordering a halt the generals at this point didn't want to order a halt because they knew once these guys stopped they stopped because they were so burned out they were pumped they're doing Multiple hits of crystal meth every day, and they're going into combat. So this is one of the things uh, that was going on. There was a battle, a great book called uh, The 50 Deadliest. There's two of these done by Paul Kirshner, who was a fellow Paladin Press writer. And he also uh, he did The Deadliest Men, 
50 more deadly or something like that. And, and, and he also did a book on the history of the duel. Now, in one battle in Italy, the Allies pretty much consistently get their ass kicked in Italy, all the way up the peninsula. Italy is a tough place to invade. I played Anzio, which is an old Avalon Hill game a few times, and I can even use Italian troops pretty effectively against the Allies because of the train. Well, anyhow, there is one platoon. A platoon's over 30 guys. Stuck in a house, surrounded by only a squad of Germans in this hilly country, uh, not far from Mount Cassino, uh, in the breakout from the Anzio beachhead. And this guy shows up there. The guy was a nut, never got along with anybody. A very common uh, American hero war story thing. Like Cool Hand Luke. Luke. Cool Hand Luke, they said, oh, see, you did good in the war, but now you're in trouble, and now you're in here. You're on this chain gang. Well, this is very common. Guys that have trouble with authority and getting along under highly domesticated situations, uh, from amongst this group of guys, you get your best war fighters. And this guy, I forget his name, he's one of these guys. He's also a country boy, I believe. Uh, he uh, comes into this house to seek cover, and it's packed with officers, NCOs, and men who are just cowering. American platoon that's seen its first combat, and they're going up against uh, these uh, hardened, experienced Jerry's, who the Germans are outnumbered four to one. But they got these guys pinned down in his house, and nobody's even firing their weapons. And he just starts going around to these guys and taking their weapons and emptying them at the enemy. Bazookas, machine guns, submachine guns, M1 Garands, Tommy guns, your 45 caliber submachine gun, okay? Uh, your M1 carbine. And he's emptying everybody's, everybody's weapons at these Germans until these guys retreat, until the Germans retreat, because there's so much firepower coming from the house. Now, they're all in danger of being killed, him and the other guys. Some of these other guys get killed. He doesn't get killed. Okay? I mean, just being in this in this house, you were eventually all going to get killed, yet these guys are not firing back. Okay? There's a natural aversion amongst normal humans, and an industrial conscript army it is taken from a normal swath of industrial humanity just conscripted in there they're not pre-selected as killers you know mma fighters hunters nothing like that although you will find that a high uh incidence of killers they were hunters they were guys that could point and shoot at a living thing and they had the basic marksmanship skills they ended up becoming snipers uh and this was uh uh when i talked to one of the guys I'm staying with out here, he was a colonel, and he saw combat a few times in two different theaters. He told me that the guys are naturally good in combat, or the hunters like him that came from a rural background, used to killing man-sized animals, and smaller and larger. Uh, so they have these different immersions in the killing experience, and they have these different targeting practices. Uh, he said the suburban guys weren't worth a shit. Universally, they just weren't worth anything. The Guys that the country boys got along with were the city boys, the criminals, okay, who grew up in their own dangerous environment and were used to a certain amount. Maybe they had blue collar jobs, they worked with their hands, they got fist fights on the job, they got locked up occasionally, they got drunk after work and they got in a fight and they got locked up. Then they're in with even harder cases in the joint. So when you look at this broad swath of humanity coming from the rural, the urban and the suburban, and most of them are at this point are coming from the early suburban, which is the suburban areas of the outer city, not the inner city. That's predominantly a suburban army, yet all the war heroes come from rural and urban settings. So that's not really a true, yeah, you're looking at America in a draft, but it's not really a true representation because if you take out all the killers you don't have any suburban boys you don't have any guys with office jobs all you have is the hunters and the criminals you got the rural boys and you've got the criminals that's where all your killers came from in these armies and today the guys from the city that are killers are going into the military to get better at at using weapons in service to their gang, 
which is the real affiliation that they have. And they're in the regular military trying to get into airborne Marines or something like that to try to get some good training, take it back to the gang. Almost everybody that's in the Navy SEALs, I, don't, I think there's only like ever been two black Navy SEALs. Okay. These are all rural guys. Uh, Rangers, the guys that I'm staying in a camper where a Ranger lives when he's home on leave right now. The guy up the way was an Army Ranger. The, the guy who I dug the ditch for the other day. The Rangers all come from the rural environment. All right. Most of your special ops guys, they come from the rural environment. So if we would just look at suburbanites, you know, we're way down from that three in 10 people who are willing to fight the enemy or willing to point a gun at another human being and shoot, even if that's the enemy. You know, so it's a sliding scale. And, yeah, you know, and so like you can't said, say a blanket yeah. statement. You know? And like you said before, it's probably more like 3% of the people that I live next to. I won't disclose well, where if I live. You're look, if, you're looking at sub, if you're looking at subdivisions, suburban <laughs> subdivisions, the people are completely, uh, yeah. for, for the most yeah. part. Yeah, and then you said, and you clarified and said also, look, it's like you have, you know, uh, maybe you have 30 percent, and then within that 30 percent, there's a smaller subset that are just straight psychopathic killers that can keep killing and not, you know, uh, burn out from it. Yeah, now, uh, clinically, the U.S. military determined in World War II that 37 days was the limit. 37 days, everybody's Done. so far gone yeah. that they're just sitting there shaking. Even Ernst, of, even Ernst Younger had a freak out. In, he, went, uh, he went insane three times. Yeah. He tried to commit suicide. He went out in the field and picked flowers and drank wine during an yeah. artillery bombardment, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, you know so, and he's a right. straight killer, by the way. <laughs> right. So this guy was a straight killer, and even he went clinically insane three times. Tried to commit suicide, got shot in the head. He had these different out of body experiences that helped him get to the other side. And he had um, to do a lot of LSD afterwards. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, even even with your prime killers, it still becomes a problem. Very oftentimes later in life, it will it will still become a problem. You can see it with Alexander's men. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys committed dozens of genocides. It yeah. was twelve genocides in Afghanistan. Okay, and mm -hmm. They uh, they got drunk continuously. Mm -hmm. You know, what they, that would be how they would decompress. They would get together and get hammered. They would get drunk so much that, that they would end up killing each other sometimes in camp. Alcohol Hard poisoned too. It wasn't a Macedonian party unless someone died. <laughs> right. So there's there, there's a price to be paid. There's just a strong aversion amongst most humans to kill other humans. It can be overcome. There's lots of different ways militaries, cultures have overcome this. Some people do not naturally have this aversion. They're a very small minority. Yeah. And and then you like and then it takes like it's like you can be I guess like um I've heard it I've heard it referenced uh by someone else as like a um a strategic asshole reserve. <laughs> it, there's a utility to having these type of people. It's the problem is directing them in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, great to... glass in time of you know alien invasion. <laughs> yeah, um, guy, like, and we talked I've known about a guys like that. <laughs> yeah. and we talked about like how I would like you know the Iroquois, um, you know the kind of Iroquois um, civilization does a good job of you know not not becoming domesticated but not going full Comanche. You know? There's another thing in the tribal center, okay, uh, in the industrial wars, okay, of the 20th century, and we can include Vietnam, we can include the last industrial wars happening in 2003, 2004, in Iraq, okay, because using tank columns, using industrial levels of air power, very refined, but still industrial. Uh, Everybody goes into combat uh, under the conviction that they're fighting for an ideology that can be adopted by all humans. 
that if you read the propaganda in the training manuals going back to uh, World War II, we are fighting for democracy. We're fighting to make everybody like us, make to get to convince everybody to believe like us and to live like that, us. This country is still trafficking in that. So there is a if you believe in the cause, if you believe you're fighting for democracy, OK, then you believe you're killing a human being. When you go to our rat, you're killing a human being. Yeah, he's wrong. He shouldn't believe in what he believes in. He should believe in making money. OK, he should believe in the petrodollar. OK, you know, he should believe that, you know, uh, that that everything that comes out of Hollywood is great. OK, so. Yeah, but he's still a human being. And so this is upsetting. If you're an Iroquois warrior and you're swooping down on the Hurons, okay, well, we're going to kill some tree eaters. These people aren't even human. They eat bark. I mean, just about every Indian tribe, their name means the humans, and everybody else is the enemy. They're not even considered humans until they adopt you in. Okay? So the, the funny thing is, is the word Navajo is Anasazi for the enemy. Mm-hmm. The word Apache is Navajo for the enemy. The word Comanche is you for fights us all the time everywhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so in a tribal yeah. society, there is zero in group violence. They do not kill their own people. They do not beat their own people. They do not beat their children. In Australia, the Australoids, they do that. Some of the African tribal societies do that. I don't know if any of the Asian tribal societies do that. The tribal societies in ancient Europe, as near as I can determine, and throughout the entirety of uh, Amerindia, okay, Native America, did not do this ever. Okay, they did not do it. They did not practice in-group violence. Okay, uh, they did not beat their children. They thought that you know that the English were insane for doing this. Why would you do this? Because this person is never going to be a reliable warrior because you're going to break their spirit by letting their mother punch them in the face, you know, when they're five years old. So uh, these groups that for 200 years, the Iroquois successfully defend their territory for 200 years, the Timucan people in Florida successfully defended their territory for 300 years. The Apaches successfully defend their territory against the Mexicans, not the Comanches. The Comanches kicked their ass. OK. But they did so against the Spanish and the Mexicans, and they finally get beat by the Americans. Now, what you see with these with these tribal societies that punch way above their weight uh, and fighting against the out group, you see zero in group violence. Our problem with the psychology and Grossman, I believe, does not get into this. OK. Uh, in his book, which was granted written like 30 years ago, he doesn't really get into tribalism, he does break down the fact that it's not just fight or flight. There's fight, there's flight, there's submit, and there's posture. There, it's, it's a compass of these four aggression orientations, not fight or flight, okay? So uh, that shows you how denatured we are, that most of us still think it's just fight or flight because psychologists and psychiatrists have told us that, but that's not the way it is. So uh, I don't think he gets into the tribalism. Uh, uh, but uh, the the military unit benefits from a tribal level of cohesion, and they have found ways to become highly violent to the other group successfully. I think the U.S. military lost 5,000 guys in Iraq and killed a half a million people, something like that. It's really it's mind boggling what these military machines can do. But largely crew served weapons, largely remote, largely striking vehicles and buildings, not visible human beings. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of variables here. And even so, though, when my friend goes up to a checkpoint that was under his control and he finds an Iraqi family melted to their automobile and he's the guy that had to give the order, it bothers him because he believes these are human beings. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they're, it's not like it's a medieval crusader and he's like, uh, they're Saracens. It's like they're orcs, right? They're not yeah. even human because they're Muslim. No, he believes they're human beings. And he was told he was coming to their country to save them from their neighbors. And then here he just 
gave the order to cook five of them in the car, including women and children. So that's very damaging. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily want to be spending a couple months with a guy that that doesn't bother. Okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's uh, what, what you've got. And, and now what you have with, you have constant PTSD with us military. Uh, a friend of mine, it was a, uh, 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 who resents the military very much uh, because a friend of his that was injured there got put on opiates at the VA hospital. And then after they cut him off the opiates, he died of heroin addiction. It was laced with fentanyl because he was trying to continue to, his own illegal pain management from the injuries that he got. Uh, apparently, another aspect of this is machinery and noise. Uh, anthropologist named Cochran also made the uh, uh, observation that there wasn't PTSD before modern war. Uh, Can I ask you it, about Part of that? it could be shell shock. They originally called it shell shock. Part of it could just be the storm of steel. Yeah. I mean, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, though, but I thought there was a, at least a few hints of, I mean, it'd be wrong to call it PTSD, but uh, terror in uh, psychological angst a little bit and even in the in the ancient literature um, well, yeah <laughs> same people are going to be terrified uh, during a battle yeah but we're talking about you come home and you are incapable of interacting with normal society because of what happened in the war yeah there's no documentation of that in the ancient world I guess right and there are there are two quotes actually the fellow from the on YouTube that does Lindy Beige mm-hmm he actually reads the two quotes of ancient evidence of PTSD. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and one of them was in, one of them might've been, uh, uh, Achilles, who actually fought. In yeah. Paris. Okay. The poets back so, then fought. <laughs> so it, it's, it's something, you know, it was there, it would happen. It's a big event. Uh, especially when every able-bodied man in your community community can carry weapons, gets out there and fight. You're going to have guys that are essentially not psychologically cut out for it, that are going to be yeah. in the mix. And things yeah. are going to ha happen. But it does not become the norm no. until uh, after World War I. Smedley Butler writes about 50,000 U.S. servicemen. 250,000, I think, were killed in Europe in World War I on the U.S. side. 50,000 of our men, 12 years later, were still vegetables in catatonic states, in military asylums that he used to go visit. Now, part of this is the shell shock, the yeah. artillery, the fact that for days you could be subjected to a thunderstorm that in nature you hear once a year for an hour, and, mm -hmm. and you're subjected to this for three days straight. Okay, so that's part of it. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the other part of it, though, is the fact that you had the general population has been swept up in a dragnet and they've been used to grease this giant industrial killing machine. And you just have regular people where warriors once only went. I also think that it, I've heard uh, special ops guys say that they, they, they don't, they don't have PTSD and they attribute it to, you know, not being, um, badasses, but they say um, that they have more agency. Like they're going out and doing something. They have a mission, you know, killing people pr pretty much. But they, whereas if you're a regular infantryman, soldier, it's like this low to mid range danger all the time and you don't feel like you have any agency. And yeah, and you got fuckers like those special ops guys hunting you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, you're a dog and the wolves are after you. Okay? Yeah. I mean, now there is some special ops guys do admit to have having PTSD. Yeah. So uh, yeah, one, they don't want to admit they don't want to admit it because they're elite. Yeah. Two, they're going to have a much lower instance of it because they're special people. They're Selective. People. Yeah. OK. Also, uh, they're going to have a lower incidence of it because of their agency, because of that. Uh, what you just described, but there is something that's been creeping into it. And uh, there is a problem and it is running, it is driving military contract. Special operations guys in five, 
five different branches now. They're in combat rotations multiple times a year. The tours are now a couple of months. I don't know exactly what they are. It depends. Okay. But the tours are relatively short. But there's a lot of action. Yeah. Okay. Then you take some time back in training rotation and then you go on another tour. And they develop after, this. I'm sorry. Go ahead. After, well, the problem is after about six years of this shit, most of these guys are having problems. Okay. And what they opt down on is this is what the military is doing. They're, they're telling these guys that they've got to stay in for, to, for 20 years to get their pension. And they've got to be on at least two combat tours a year in these special ops units because these are the, you only got a thousand guys in the whole U.S. military that are actually killing people. They're in these various special operations units. Mm -hmm. okay? And they're under the Expeditionary Command, uh, the Quick Reaction Force. They're in these different branches and they're relatively busy. It's not the grind that Aldi Murphy and these other guys would have had to put up with where you're basically like grinding your way to Berlin and there's no end to it until it's over. But on the other hand, there's no victory in sight. They know that this country is going to go to war in another country. They're fighting in 31 countries a year and they know this. They know it's the forever war and it's never ending. So they don't have a finish line. There's going to be no victory parade and they uh, they aren't confident that they're going to be able to stick out 20 years of regular rotations into combat and keep their shit together. So they're taking four times the money and they're taking their government skills and they're going in, going in a military military contract. It's still surprising to me that um, I've heard that before that gangbangers gangsters will try to join the military and learn skills in the military which ostensibly sounds like reasonable enough as a goal but for them but i don't see how they could have the discipline to last four or five years well some guys some guys do you're talking about the guy that's going to be the armor he's going to be like the number three guy in the gang and you're talking okay. about highly organized guys the guys most likely to do this are not the african-american guys. okay the Latino gangs. Oh. These, these guys are a military organization. These um. guys exterminate the African American gangs everywhere they choose to, easily. Okay. The uh, uh, there is a, the paratroop. There was a para. There was a para unit in Mexico that formed a gang. All of their former members formed a gang, and they sold themselves out to the other to the three main cartels. As muscle. Now yeah, they have their good. own. Now they have their own fourth cartel, the military cartel, separate from the police and the military, who both duke it out with each other, and the three major cartels. There's now the former paratrooper badass cartel that basically just traffic in one thing, and that gets them anything else they want. Like these, it, you know, mercenary so, bands in the Middle Ages or something. Right. So you're talking about the Latino culture. Uh, uh, these guys have a real culture, a real society. The uh, I, I've told this story before, but I'll, I'll tell it to you again. I, 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 so I haven't told it to you. I was coaching a guy that is the, was the physical fitness instructor for a juvenile detention center that housed 500 inmates and had 50 prison guards. There was only he was one of two Caucasians in that facility. The other one was a big fat pale face who was repeatedly beaten up and molested by many fellow inmates and by many of the African-American staff members. He was a very large man. He was over 200 pounds, some 15-year-old, 200-pound, 250-pound guy that got severely abused. There was a kid that was well under 90 pounds, who was about 13 years old, who was a Latino kid. They didn't know what country he was from. Nobody touched him. None of the prison guards touched him. He was the only Latino in there. None of those 498 black gangbangers touched him. Okay, so what does that tell you? That, that means it tells you that his tell. uncles yeah. are some bad people. <laughs> okay, yeah. so, so these are the kind of guys that are seriously going into the military to get weapons training. When the African-American gangs 
uh, they want one of their people to go into the military. Just so that they can learn the basics of using a firearm. Not so that they're going to learn tactics or anything like that, because these people don't use tactics. It's all about having one shooter that's going to go out there and hose somebody down. They want to at least learn how to use the firearms. Because there's uh, a shortage of places where you can go conduct your live fire exercises when you're in the ghetto. Because you got like these blue light cameras that are going to announce to police that they're firing in this area. Okay? And it's actually kind of hard to... Uh, safety, safely outfit these basements. Two homeboys, one of them accidentally got killed doing uh, practice firing in a basement in East Baltimore a couple of years ago. So uh, but with, with the African-American gangs, they would like to recruit a guy that like went through boot camp and actually learned how to clean a gun and like shoot. Okay, They would like that, but that's as far as their thinking goes. Uh, where the Latino gangs and the, the Puerto Ricans and Dominicans are putting guys into the military, and some of them are actually pretty highly disciplined. Okay, uh, the uh, the African American gangs are infiltrating the police force. Now, the Latino gangs are also doing this. There are actually in the LAPD there are actually Latino police gangs that are dedicated gangs within the police department. OK, so uh, your African-American guys are more likely to infiltrate the police department and uh, get a couple of the guys on the inside. And then that guy can give them some handgun handling advice. OK, yeah. Or they're going to just hire their they're going to buy their weapon from some redneck and they're going to go out in the country and this redneck's going to teach them how to shoot okay. <laughs> or, in, in return for some drugs or something like that. You know, and, sp and speaking of the Baltimore gangs, it, as of 1998, the FBI listed between 200 and 210 gangs in Baltimore City. Good Lord. Now, these are sets. These aren't like something like the Crips. Like mm -hmm. in Baltimore, you got Crip 52. That's just a Harlem Park neighborhood, and they call themselves Crip 52. Okay? That's just a neighborhood. These are like little neighborhood gang sets. Now, dozens of these gangs become extinct every year because amongst these criminals, you basically have a one in five killer rule. One in five of these guys is a killer. Uh, most of them will stand up and fight, particularly if their buddies are there. Okay. Uh, but still, only about one in five of these guys are like reliable killers, like this guy is going to go out and you know somebody's dead. Okay. He's going to go clear that corner and whoever's swinging crack on that corner, he's dead. Okay. Because so and so's got the gun and he's that guy. Okay. Now, what happens is you usually have uh, uh, two of these guys in a gang set of a loose affiliation, loose to tight affiliation of 10 people. You got 10 guys in a gang set. Two of them are basically killers. One of them's a stone cold guy. One of them is the brains. Okay. Yeah. Once one or two of these guys gets killed, the gang just goes away. Because there's no longer that lethal element to keep it a, a, as, as a force. It no longer has the teeth to deal with the other gangs. You know, so th that's about what it is. If you're talking about the hood, you're talking yeah. two, two and ten guys, stone cold killers, in a gang. Now... Yeah, only two and ten guys, yeah, in the ten guys are in a gang, you know. So not everybody's yeah. in the gang, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and so, yeah, so again, it's it's a selection process. But even amongst the ones that are now, every one of them ten guys will stomp you to death together. Mm -hmm. Okay, every one of them ten guys will hold you down while one of them stabs you. Every one of those ten guys is a killer under pack dynamics. Okay, but. Once you get them alone, only two of them guys are killers. And that's how you deal with these people. Okay, because logistically, it's very difficult for them to all be together. It's suicide. They're all, it's, they're all going to get bagged by the pigs, right? So they're split up. Only two and there's ten of them. Two and ten of them are killers. Well, where are the two killers? Well, one, they're both banging the best-looking babes. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so one of them's active, one of them's not. They usually switch. Up. You figure two guys running a neighborhood. Well, one of them's resting while the other one's running shit. Yeah. Okay, so, and then is he with anybody? Okay, the, the other guys. You know, so you have these different qualifications. You can get an extremely violent gang like the Baltimore, the, the black gorilla family, which is called the BGF in Baltimore. These are guys that killed John Gotti in the D.C. jail. I think it was, I think it was Western Maryland. But uh, the black gorilla family, Terrence White, actually impregnated four corrections officers while he was an inmate. Okay. All right. Yeah. He ran that shit with his dick. Okay. All right. So the black gorilla family is a place that could call on squad level units of killers. Okay. You could run into three of them guys and they're all killers. Yeah. More than likely, it's four of them, and one of them's just a lookout. Okay. One of them's bait, and two of them are killers. Okay. It depends on how, on how they work it. But, you know, you, know, you have all these – the military deals with these use of force scenarios just like your criminals do. And just like the cops do. You know, most regular police just don't do shit until the tactical squad shows up anymore. They're just supposed to, like, you know, if somebody pulls a gun, they've got to try to shoot, you know. Uh, but if they get somebody holed up in a house or they got a standoff situation or something, they're just supposed to not get hurt and call in SWAT. Okay, so law enforcement, military, uh, gangs, they all have they all have these dynamics. Yeah. And that makes sense. I mean, and I guess when we talk about um, part of the, I guess to segue into more going back into a different time, <laughs> pre-industrial time, if you look at the ancient world and you see combat army, you know, a lot of the guys in ancient Greece, for example, uh, since we recently talked about Greece, um, the, the the most of the people except for Sparta were regular people that um, they may not run their farm <laughs> uh, day to day, but they're they're not uh, training for hoplite battle every day. Right. Um, it would be like a Sunday thing. It would be like what they did in uh, Puritan New England, where yeah. uh, one day a week the train band gets together and they train. And it's kind of interesting, too, like, when you have uh, a lot of the, the champion-type fights or the where you have like a, a challenge match to s- decide if uh, instead of having a battle um, – it's it's interesting when you know for much of the record that we have i mean even sometimes these are mentioned um it's it's fascinating when you look at like um alexander the great for example uh you know he when when i think about him and i think about uh a, you know a, a heroic figure um and i and i don't and I and there's a lot of there's so much revisionism going on and bullshit, but um, I mean the guy, you know, was around like his companions trained. He knew these guys, his top lieutenants or his top generals. Really, he grew up with them. He wrestled with them. He trained with them. He learned with them. And um, these guys were you know on the front line. Um in battle and a lot of people mention the different like you know, once you get to you know pa- after world war one uh you don't really have uh frontline commanders you know and, and even before that you know people talk about napoleon uh and him being kind of out in the front here and there but uh in the ancient world i mean that's what struck me as the most amazing thing not even just with alexander but with any of the commanders often like you know, when the commander's taken out, the, the whole battle's lost. Well, that's um, why the Romans didn't do that. The Romans had a managerial approach. They had the most vicious 
soldiers, but mm-hmm. generally their uh, commanders were managerial figures that were behind the lines and weren't particularly good. Uh, the centurion's different. The centurion, he's uh, he's up there with his men. Uh, when Alexander the Great, mm-hmm. uh, Harold Lamb wrote a book, wow, 1930s maybe. Harold Lamb, uh, or maybe 1920s, wrote a book titled Alexander, which is a novelized version of his life, which a lot of people would find a pleasing read. A historian named Hammond wrote a stripped-down history of Alexander in the 1990s. It's a thin, blue, hardback book, and he just goes through all the facts and finds them to be a very pious and practical uh, leader, very religious-minded. Uh, my favorite book is Robin Lane's Fo- Robin Lane Fox, who wrote Pagans and Christians. He wrote a book called uh, In Search of Alexander the Great, probably the best overall general history that, that is easy to read and isn't too academic. The best academic history other than Hammond's is by a guy named Green, and it's just titled Alexander. I also believe that's a 90s book. The Robin Lane Fox book, is, I think, is was written in the 80s, Lamb in the 20s or 30s. And um, I mean, those are just four, that, uh, four titles that people could probably look at uh, for, uh, for Alexander the Great. You know, but he was... Uh, he was a heroic uh, uh, military leader. He was brilliant, and his style of leadership reemerged in the Roman Empire under the Greek uh, the, uh, the Greek leadership that uh, rejuvenated the uh, Roman Empire in the e- mostly in the East, uh, but they did invade uh, Italy a couple of times to try to get it back. Um, uh, and they got back to leading on a horse. Uh, what, what you would see in that movie Gladiator, uh, where uh, in that battle where, you know, the Roman leader gets on a horse and, and yeah. after he sets the plan in motion, he goes out there and he does his flank attack and everything. Roman commanders didn't do that until they got Hellenized again in the 200s after the great disaster of the barbarian invasion uh, invasions of the 260s then uh, you'd have people like valentinian then then you got the guys that are duking it out with the germanic barbarians and fighting the persians uh and are now again fighting like alexander the great did uh and the diodachi did and the the interesting thing about um i mean i think there's a lot of um there's a lot of another thing that makes me interested in, in Greece is because I see similarities, even though it's so far back between uh, that world and our world today, with the, the political machinations and backstabbing and all that stuff. It's particularly when when you deal with Athens, but even with Sparta after they become an empire themselves, but you. You see how they oh, only last for 30 years, right? <laughs> yeah. Spartans shit the bed on that, and then they got run over by Epidinonis at, yeah. uh, at Wakreta. Uh, all he and, did is he just stacked his he just stacked his men 50 deep and turned into a giant dough roller, okay, and just ran over the Spartan king and his top guys. It was pretty simple. But phalanx <laughs> meant roller. And so, the, yeah. yeah and, it's interesting that uh, it's like we. I mentioned this before, like how it's a misnomer to think that the Athenians were like uh, sub-tier compared to the Spartans, because you also said that the Spartans feared the Athenians. Yes. You know? and, yes. And the small city states feared the Athenians more than they feared the Spartans. They looked to the Spartans as their protectors because they knew the logistical fragility of Spartans internal structure and that there just wasn't a lot of Spartans. There's only 10,000 of them. They never managed to grow their population. They ruled over like a hundred thousand slaves, which had to systematically murder. So, uh, they weren't that much of a threat to the outside world. They were just peerless warriors. The Athenians were, 
the Athenians fucked a lot more. They had more kids, okay, because they, they were more like they, they wanted stuff. They, they weren't just uh, <laughs> barracks and, 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 and trying to be the perfect warrior. So the Athenians have this avaricious quality that struck fear into the heart of smaller communities. And the Athenians conducted numerous genocides. And why do you think that, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I know about the helots, the helots, the slaves were for Sparta, you know, that did their farming for them. And they and, fought too. 300 helots died with the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it looks like the more kind of precarious the Spartan situation got, the more willing they were to arm, arm them. And, um, and the, and, but the, it's like you, you rightly say that Athens had a slave economy too, and oh. so how, you know the silver mine. Well, let me out. frame let me frame it out. Okay, so uh, Athens basically twenty five thousand free men, two hundred fifty thousand slaves. <laughs> the silver mines are packed with ten thousand dying men constantly. They constantly need to be replaced. So why did Athens not have the helot problem? that the Spartans had, you know, like they didn't okay. constantly have to deal Athens with. Athens had 25,000 men. The Spartans had 10,000. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the Spartans had a huge helot population. Okay. That was dispersed. Yeah. It, it wasn't jammed into, uh, into this women at the Attic Peninsula was, uh, was very, uh, was very small and barren. It was good for olive trees and it was good for ports. And they had to get their wood and their grain from from other places. So they already were in a position where they were bullying a lot of people around. And because they had this maritime economy, they could replace their slaves a lot. So they worked them to death was the tendency. They trafficked them a lot. It was probably their slave trading that got them that plague that ended up killing Pericles. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, because they brought a lot of people in from Egypt and the East and stuff. It looks like uh, Ethiopia and India were the main places that the plagues came from that afflicted ancient Greece and Rome. Now, the uh, the numbers of the Helots uh, compared to the Spartans, uh, on, on the surface, it looks the same as what the Athenians were looking at. But it was... Uh, it was really worse because they were more spread out. It was rural, and the um, the system of similars uh, that the that the Spartans used uh, didn't really allow for much upward mobility. So they had uh, they didn't have a lot of use for outsiders. They'd adopt a couple of them, like Xenophon and Themistocles, maybe mm -hmm. some high status ones, but the uh, Athenians used a lot of resident aliens who were not slaves. The Spartans didn't really have that. Only a couple of like rock star visitors. That's it. Yeah. And one at a time, you know, but the Athenians had significant populations of resident aliens who were very useful, who had to serve in the military. OK. And also, if they got out of line, you could enslave them or kill them. And they didn't have any relatives in town. Aristotle was a resident alien i think isocrates was a resident alien also a lot of the scholars were you know so you you had uh you had more than a two-dimensional system that the spartans just had these two dimensions they they basically had your similars they had the periochi the the ones that lived around which are the people that they granted second tier status to but weren't right there with them they would be like the acadians uh that that were like their faster running guys. I had a little bit smaller shield, but then you got this huge populations of Messenians. The Helots were, the other thing is the Athenians had slaves. They bought from everywhere. The Spartans enslaved a larger tribe called the Messenians. Yeah, this would which, be like the Zosha enslaving the Zulus. Yeah. It you seems know, this can go bad fast yeah it's like you have an intact people that you just constantly for generations have enslaved it seems like so so you have that cohesion there these were people that once had their own city they even yeah. defeated Sparta once and the athenians had to come and help them out so the yeah, athenians have this yeah. atomized slave population 
the yeah. Athenians ran their society very much like America runs its society. That's what and I'm saying. a lot of different factions <laughs> against each other. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's but why it's so analogous. Yeah. The, the Spartans had this really – they didn't call themselves Helots. They called themselves Mycenaeans. And eventually they got their freedom and they even had their own heroes. And uh, it seems like this got their freedom from the Spartans, I think, in the 200s and the 100s. It seems like the, the Spartans, in a way, like kind of like the Aztecs with those people that live around, you know, they, the Aztecs, if I'm not mistaken, had uh, tribes that weren't exactly on uh, under their, they were like the allied tribes. with, yeah, they had subjugated. So, yeah. The Aztecs didn't have a Roman system. The, the Romans, once they uh, would uh, conquer the Etruscans, okay, or conquer the Samites, then after a certain period of time, they say, okay, you can be Romans now. You yeah. can join. Okay. Uh, the Aztecs didn't have that. You know, the Tlaxlacans were the Tlaxlacans, you know. Yeah. They had to send so many sacrificial victims a year. The best looking girls had to be sent to Montezuma. You know, it, it's, the, it's the deal. <laughs> You know, so that's just like ongoing, never ending animosity. Uh, the Romans, yeah. the Romans had a much more corrosive way of conquering a people <laughs> by, you know, offering admittance into the cartel. And, it, and it's like the with the Athenians, it, it seemed like all the Greeks, you know, very had a very high sense of their polis, of their other people. Um, but they they guarded citizenship uh, very very much. So that is a difference than today, where you know the Athenians were mercantile and you know a sea people, um, commercial people in a lot of ways, like you know today's America. But they, unlike today's America, Athens guarded its citizenship. I mean, well, the Athenians that was a democracy. Okay, mm-hmm. so you have. In the Greek, in the Hellenic world of the time, you have in the colonial areas, you have a mixture of oligarchies and tyrannies. The tyrannies are usually savior situations where a leader who has arisen and has overthrown the abuse of oligarchs who have their cabal of super rich guys screwing everybody up. Okay. So we, we kind of have the idea of tyranny reversed to how the Greeks saw it. In the Greek view, the tyrant was a savior. He could go bad. He could end up becoming like a bad king or uh, an individual oligarch. Okay, but So you have overseas in the colonies. You have, particularly in Sicily, you have tyrants. Then you have oligarchs. The predominant Hellenic form of government was the oligarchy. It is the group of property power brokers that get together in the back room and they decide what's what. Okay. Um, basically just put, it would be like everybody in America being told that, you know what, there's been something called the deep state that's been ruling you for a hundred years, 110 years. And now we're going to be nice enough to tell you what it is. These five corporations and 15 banks run everything. You play ball or else your wife's going to be miserable and it's going to end quickly. Okay. That's what most of the ancient Greek states were on a miniature scale. Scale that is more tolerable on a local scale than on a massive scale because it's not as dehumanizing. Then you have the Athenians with their democracy. And then the Spartans have their own weird ass monarchy that has two kings and a council of ephors that are like oligarchs without the oligarchic power. So, yeah. uh, you know, so what the Spartans are, the Spartans are just like this weird wild card yeah. that that the uh, the oligarchies can grab onto. And so you've got the Athenians are fomenting uh, revolution in a lot of oligarchies at the same time by sponsoring internal dissent amongst like the second family who is going against the first family, okay? Uh, and the first family is being supported by maybe families three, four, and five. That second family is being more supported externally by Athens at the same time that Athens is threatening the oligarchy. One of the families in the oligarchy 
is rebelling. Yeah, it's pretty dirty politics right there. But yeah, so know. there was a whole lot of that going on. So the Athenians were to be feared because they had the best navy, bar none. They had their hoplites were as good as anybody except for the Thebans and the Spartans. Okay, so they got the number three army. They got the number one navy. They got the most money. Uh, yeah. They got spies everywhere. <laughs> and they have um, they have access to the Black Sea. You know, they got the rain. Yeah. There. And it, and it's like they they seem to be highly effective at um you know they were all over the Mediterranean. I mean they they're so predacious. Like you could see them gobbling up one island after another. Um, they're ambitious, okay, and innovative, just like the American GI that Victor Davis Hanson likes so much. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that he was a farm boy so he can fix that shitty Sherman tank. OK. Yeah. All right. So that's something to deal with. You know, so the Athenians had that. The Athenians had this ability to innovate because they had this mercantile economy. They were very greedy and there was always a payday for the innovator where the Spartan innovator would risk humiliation. His most important thing is his honor. Uh, so Sparta is this distillation of the Aryan honor culture. And Athens is kind of this distillation of the Aryan invasion culture. Yeah, it seems like to me, I feel like the Athenians were inspired by Odysseus a lot. <laughs> That's right. The the clever trickster. Um, yeah. The guy, yeah. You know. Yeah, it's yeah. almost Spartan against Sparta against Athens is almost like Achilles yes. against Odysseus. Exactly. That's how I. That's how I see it. Um, and the other thing is. What's cool about one of my favorite um, savior, general, <coughs> savior generals in Athens is Themistocles because he wasn't an uh, aristocrat, you know, and he was a half breed, apparently. You know, he was half Athenian and his mother was from somewhere else. Um, I think she was from, like, they don't even know exactly. Um, maybe. One of those little cities they burned. <laughs> yeah. 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 She was probably a spear bride, right? Right, yeah, it's the girl with the biggest ass from Methuene. <laughs> <laughs> he comes up, you know, and he's, you know, these are anecdotes from Plutarch, but he, there's probably something to it. You know, he would basically uh, get the rich kids to play with him. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, it, it's just really fascinating because he, he basically, you find him early on the scene, he's at um, Marathon. Um, and so he knows the Persian, you know, how the Persians are. And that's, what's interesting too, because everybody's clamoring. You read the sources and they're all saying Sparta's going to save us. It's so important for Sparta, you know, to get in, um, in this war. Meanwhile, cities are dropping left and right. Thebes, you know, goes to, to Persia. Thessaly goes to Persia. Um, you know, and it's like Athens is getting hemmed in. I mean, to me, the, the Mystocles is like the savior general. I mean, it's like his whole um, story arc is it, it needs to be dramatized in film. You know, <laughs> I have I have two from that period. Yeah. OK. Brassius, the Spartan general. OK. Yeah. Who Thucydides faced. Yeah. And he defeated Thucydides and Thucydides immortalized him and talked about. How brave he was. He was very fair. He wasn't as pig headed as the other Spartans. He was a guy that if he had not been killed trying to help uh, cowardly allies against the Athenians, he seemed like he was the only Spartan that would have been able to like decently rule. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But there was no he was so brave there was no way he was getting out of the other end of this thirty year long war. You know, he dies within like the first five years of it, but he had the highest character, according to his enemy, who yeah. was actually defeated and humiliated by him. Now, the um, the other guy is an Athenian, Xenophon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Zeno, the first part means stranger. Now, what, is Fon fire? Or, or what? I don't know what P-H, I forget what P-H-O-N means anymore. But yeah. Zeno means uh, stranger. Well, he was uh, just one of the captains 
of one of the many mercenary units from various uh, Greek uh, communities that had followed, uh, I think, Cyrus the Younger to mm -hmm. uh, battle his uh, brother uh, in uh, Upper Mesopotamia for uh, the kingship of uh, the Archimedean Empire. And uh, Cyrus is killed in battle. Then the Greek generals are invited to a parley and they're murdered. So the only thing that's left is the captains. So Xenophon and this psychopathic Spartan end up being uh, yeah. elected as rotating commanders of this retreat of these 10,000 infantrymen in this uh, foreign country where they're surrounded by horsemen. Yeah. And they got to fight their way through mountains. So, and the Spartans ended up developing a very, uh, a like for him. Uh, like I said, Gene Wolfe uh, dedicated his, uh, uh, his novel, Soldier in the Mist, about, uh, you know, uh, the guy suffering from short-term chronic memory loss after the Battle of uh, Marathon. Uh, I have that book. I should read it. <laughs> I, I, I highly recommend it. It's, Wolf it was probably the most sensitive writer of speculative fiction in the late 20th century, and he understood uh, many... Uh, many of the iterations of the ancient mind, not just the ancient Greeks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but he understood them well enough to present it in a fashion that a modern person could get into. Part of the technique he uses is immersion in storytelling. He has it just, and it won't make any sense. It, it will be, it will not be plot driven at some point in the middle of one of his books. One of the characters will tell another character a story. And the story is just like its own little world. Mm -hmm. And see if you can, he's making no attempt to connect it to anything in the main plot or anything like that. But it's a method he uses to really get you immersed uh, in the characters because he's now using one of the characters as an actual storytelling tower. So he's putting himself out of the way as the author and uh, he's achieving a lighter narrative touch. You know, so I highly recommend that. Uh, so, uh, soldier in the or Latro in the Mist, which is a soldier of Ariti and or soldier in the soldier of the mist and soldier of Ariti. There's a third sequel which I have not read, but uh, the uh, he gets the military aspects and the individual individual combatant uh, mechanics okay. Uh, in the book, I, I was I was good with his treatment of that, which says a lot because it's something almost everybody ruins and uh. What he really does is he uh, he captivates you with the metaphysical substructure of the Hellenic world. What these people believe is real. So Latro gets hit in the head during the Battle of Marathon. A Persian healer heals him before the army of the great king starts to retreat into Persia because he's an Italian mercenary. He's an Italic. He's a Latin mercenary fighting for the Persians. And he doesn't have any of his friends around. The healer, this Magi, gives him a scroll and a stylus and says, here, you write your memory every day because every morning you wake up forgetting what happened the day before. So all he has is the, the distant memory of his childhood and the knowledge of his craft as a soldier. He's a professional soldier. And he has a falcata, like a copish. And uh, he's a, a prime stud athlete, so he manages to impress the people he run into. But he has a trade-off. It turns out he's cursed by the mother goddess because he fought a battle near Advent, which was, I think, the shrine of Persephone, near where the Battle of Pateau occurred. So he's cursed by the mother goddess uh, to forget. Every morning when the mist closes in before he goes to sleep. But when he's awake, he can see the gods. He oh can God. see the satyrs. He can see the muses. He can see the furies. He can see the whole metaphysical substructure. It seems right up my alley. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's one of the best books that I've, I've ever read. Uh, well, that's you know, high but, <laughs> but that, uh, I think it would help people of our period mm -hmm. that have some stomach for fiction 
to kind of get into the idea of uh, what these people in their mind's eye saw around them, because they were much closer to the to the earth than we were. So all these people were highly rural compared to us. Even the Athenians that lived in the cities were, you know, you know were involved usually in agriculture or some type of produce handling, the olive oil trade, something, something agrarian was showing up in just about every aspect of even their urban environments. That's what's interesting about uh, Xenophon is we have, there's a lot of things that he, that survived that he read, you know, the, the Hellenica, but also the Persian expedition that you talked about, but you also have, he wrote the edu- the Cyropedia, which yeah. is the education of Cyrus. He wrote a book on horses. He wrote a book on hounds. He wrote a book on estate management. And he, it's like, it's it's interesting that he wrote a book on the education of Cyrus and like you know made a Persian um, nobleman. You know, I uh, this is again like one of those things where you. Um, you admire your foe or the other, you know, and well, they it's realized in- that they were cousins. Mm-hmm. The <laughs> culture was very different. You got like these half naked dudes looking for the, you know, the permanent tan. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and they like to run. Yeah. And then the Persians are like uh, heavily dressed horsemen. Yeah. Okay, but they have mutually intelligible religious faiths. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have uh, a lot of cultural similarities. They had the same honor culture. The Greeks are more duplicitous than the Persians. And the Persians, you know, there's the saying that they, a nobleman would learn, a noble boy should learn how to shoot a bow, ride a horse, and tell the truth. Right, and uh, I think Jeff Cooper, the guy that used to run Gunskite, training uh firearms training i think in texas or arkansas he, he wrote a book called to uh shoot ride and speak the truth something like that but it's but it was based on that i think it comes yeah. from the cyropedia i think it i think that's just excellent um values excellent but um they yeah. knew that they were uh, they were racially very close mm-hmm. they just went down different sides of the black sea when it yeah. came out of the caucasus mountains yeah. And um, there were uh, there was a long period of coexistence with the Anatolian Greeks. Mm-hmm. They weren't particularly uh, oppressed by the Persians. The uh, one thing that's interesting is Darius, uh, the king, Darius II, who was defeated by Alexander. Alexander wanted him taken alive. He regarded him as his brother. Yeah. would have probably let him keep his throne because Alexander just wanted to conquer as a means of exploring the world. That's what and, kind of... Yeah, yeah. And, and and Darius's mother adopted Alexander. Yeah, and the, there's a couple things here in keeping it going with Xenophon and Alexander is that I've always had the inkling, I don't know if scholars think this or not, but I've always had the inkling that uh, the the notion that I have to believe that Alexander re- read uh, the Persian expedition, you know, oh, yeah. And, yeah, his father did and saw the vulnerabilities, you know, besides yeah. all the Persian wars, but just really fairly not that long, but, you know, before his generation, I guess it would be, I don't know, uh, 70 years. So a couple of generations okay. before Persian. So death. Xenophon is living with the Spartans and writing. Around 370 BC. Yeah. The Thebans are crushing the Spartans at Lacreta around 370 BC. And Philip of Macedon, hostage prince of the Thebans, is witnessing this. Yeah. The stacking of the phalanx. <laughs> right. This is his, uh, and then that's Alexander's father. Uh, I. You know, the jury's out on whether Alexander was complicit in his assassination. I do not think so. I don't think uh, he was. His mother definitely was. Hey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that woman, <laughs> they, they, they I, I stand. perfect actress to play her. In this, yeah. In this you got to admit, though, 
I think, you know, this whole thing about um, whether women had power or not, you know, is such funny. It's like that woman may have been the, one of the most powerful women of all time. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Alexander was trying to get away f- from his mom his whole life. She would write him and say, hey, when can I come to Babylon? He'd be like, hey, I need you to stay in Macedonia. Yeah, he was adopted twice. This is a queen and how Canarsis adopted him. And then Darius' yeah, really mother him. adopted him. So you, Matt, you know that Olympias would have killed both those bitches. <laughs> yeah. <Okay? laughs> right? You know, that was like, he's like, no, I can't let you meet my stepmom or my adopted mom. Or, or that won't go over well. You'll be weak. <laughs> I'm sure that he, <laughs> she was whispering in his ear that he was related to Achilles, you know, uh, his whole life. Uh, um, she, comes, she came from Epirus. <laughs> Epirus was uh, the seat of Zeus of the Oak, uh, the cult. Uh, centered around Dodona. There was a, uh, an ancient grove of oaks there. So this would go all the way back to the pre-Aryan uh, uh, faith and would actually remain uh, the uh, Odinism is related to this and is not wholly Aryan. It's partially from that indigenous old European forest thread. That's interesting. Okay, And the nuttiest of all the Epirates was Pyrrhus of Epirus, who's probably the most fun savior general, because that's what he did. <laughs> yeah. Because he was an idiot. Yeah. Anybody said, hey, save us. We're, we're being faced with an unbeatable army. He's like, yeah, I can talk somebody into coming with me. I'll be right there. We'll win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was and crazy. He was like he, one of his or something. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, he, I mean, Olympia, like she, she was running shit like after he died or at least trying to. Um, and it was amazing, like how not too much of an aside, but I just came to me like apparently um, one of the opposing armies after, you know, during the uh, secession or Diadochi wars, you know, they, she, it, her presence alone was enough to shame the Macedonian veterans. You know, just to not fight, which, you know, that's powerful right there, uh, even if it's not true. <laughs> well, um, they, they got her boy killed. Yeah, they did. Uh, yeah, you know, essentially, he tried to commit suicide after they refused to follow him into India when he jumped over that wall. Um, yeah. Went down the Indus River and took that injury to his lung. He got a lung puncture. That, uh, in the end, that combined with malaria and heavily drinking and whatever poison anybody slipped in his drink probably killed him. But um, yeah, yeah, he was he was going to make sure he died doing something heroic. Uh, once yeah, again, decided they weren't going to walk all the way across the world. That's what's so amazing is that like that last battle, whatever it was, he's like up on the wall, like and they're you know they basically ref- refused to fight anymore, and he climbed up on the wall somehow didn't get killed was up on the wall and then he drops down and then they panic and just bum rush he was punishing them yeah <laughs> that, that uh, the um um uh, you know the speech uh that he gave those uh, that he gave those guys uh oh and the march back through Gedrosia. oh yeah yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, he he tor- he tormented these guys. He was also yeah, trying to outdo Hercules, though. I think yeah. he was trying to do outdo the you know all the labors of Hercules in a way. Well, and they were, um, that, you know, he was just going to keep going because he he wanted to do great things, and his tool was the army. It wasn't like a period where you could just have a ship and a crew and go all around the world or yeah, you know, uh, something it like was, that. He had an army. That's what it, he had. It, it also in in some of like when he he was trying to he was getting these um kind of half breed Persians that had been bred with his Macedonians trained up to be you know <laughs> his elite force probably um, before he died yeah because that, that, was, that didn't go over too good with the Macedonian veterans no, either, they were freaking out <laughs> um, there, Stephen Pressfield who wrote Gates of Fire yeah. He wrote something called The Tides of War, which is about Alcibiades' disaster and uh, Syracuse, before the walls of Syracuse. Yeah, that's a but good he book. also wrote, 
two Alexander novels, the, uh, the Virtues of War mm -hmm. and the Afghan campaign. And uh, he could not get a major publisher for the Afghan campaign. Because he, took, he took a realistic view of the Afghan campaign. That's where Alexander was reduced to committing many war crimes. Mm -hmm. And it really broke the moral spirit of his army because it was a dirty war. The only two people that ever conquered Afghanistan were the Mongols and Alexander. Yeah, the Nobody British else, the British couldn't do it and the Russians couldn't do it. And what? We've been there for 20 years now? Yeah. Okay. So these are the only two people that, well, you know how the, the Mongols did business, right? You know, pyramids and skulls. Uh, yeah. That's, that, that settles a lot of rough spots. But uh, Alexander was a guy that basically wanted to intermarry and ally with the people he conquered. And then he runs into these Pashtun assholes. <laughs> and they're just not budging, so he's got to wipe them out. He doesn't have to wipe all of them out. He, he, according to the one source, he slaughtered all the Kshatriyas in the Punjab. Well, the Kshatriyas, that's the whole warrior caste. It yeah. was written as if it was a tribe. But there was, uh, in the Afghan campaign, uh, it's not from the point of view of Alexander. He's basically like the celebrity leader that rides in the camp. The first one, the virtues of war, is a lot from Alexander and Hephaestion. Okay. But from the Afghan campaign, is from the point of view of these follow-on troopers that get sent over. They're like the later Mas uh, Macedonian uh, replacements. And it's a real dirty, ugly war. It's like, you know, fighting the, the Apaches or something. And uh, it Pressfield effectively wrote himself out of a major book contract because uh, he predicted the failure of the U.S. military. And this was in 2008, I think, when he wrote the book in, in Afghanistan. So uh, Gates of Fire was great. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what the, the comic book guy ripped it off and made billions off of. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. God, that movie is so cartoonish. Um um, the did you I, see the I, first one, the 300 Spartans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I saw that when I was a kid. That's what got me interested in Greek history. Okay, so I, I saw that movie, and my father took me to this library, and uh, when I was 11, and found me a book on ancient history, and I found the account of the Battle of Thermopylae. Awesome, so, yeah. And the it was it's interesting how, um, you know. It's just how um, I go back to Themistocles, where he, the, the Athenians had this ostracism uh, practice, which is pretty interesting. Like, can you imagine us deciding <laughs> the ten people we're going to exile every year or something? <laughs> well, that's that's really normal. I, I mean, they they wrote about it, but that's um, they did end up killing some of their own people too mm -hmm. but uh how a normal tribal society is work now uh athens was made up of either 10 11 or 12 tribes it was actually made up of tribes uh some of the great poets some of their communities were made up of clans some of them were made up of tribes but they were all multiples none of them were a single tribe and athens was one of the bigger ones because it was a lot of people that were assholes that were exiled from other communities that came there. It was basically like a pirate's den. So they do keep alive. Uh, ostracism is like the healthiest thing a society uh, can do that's trying to avoid eating itself. Yeah. Okay. Because what, what most civilizations end up doing is they end up imprisoning people within them or killing them. OK, and now we're figuring out a way to morally and socially erase you without doing either. In our, in our current society, the Athenians were still, at least for their highest ranking citizens, treating them like a band of American Indians would treat one of their people that broke a rule, which is you're dead to us. You have to go, which is potentially a death sentence 
in a tribal world. Yeah. And in yeah. and in Demosthenes' case, uh, case, he when you know it, it's like he goes and then they the the bad part of it is is that they while he's ostracized they then uh, accuse him of treason um, with the plot uh, that Pausanias uh, Spartan fiasco thing and uh, so it's like he basically you know, goes from being ostracized to being accused of treason, which I don't think he committed treason. Um, And he then flees Greece and, you know, goes to Asia Minor eventually, which uh, other people do besides him. Um, But remember in the 300 Spartans in the beginning, when they're uh, the Persians are marching to Thermopylae, they have, uh, a Spartan, an exiled Spartan king with them. Yeah. You know, this is very common. If you're an empire, you could really manipulate your your uh, orbital tribal societies in small city states by just accepting their exiles. Yeah, so and, this is a very good imperial policy to accept exiles. And um, the sad thing about the Mescalese is that he ends up committing suicide. I, I wonder... You know what really did him in, uh, as far as I guess it was just too much thinking about how the hero of the Battle of Salamis and and also someone that had you know fought at Marathon before that. Well, he's uh, he's I believe he's part of Victor Davis Hanson's uh, Savior Generals book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Themistocles, he's the classic one. The, the example of the guy that uh, is willing to take risks that the other people in society will not take, he saves them, and then they punish him because they have a hard time coexisting with somebody like him, you know, in the, the normal day-to-day. Uh, you know, so he probably fit that. Uh, that was probably his best pick. All of his picks were excellent. I really uh, uh, I really like that book. Uh Belisarius is my favorite, the Byzantine general mm-hmm. who virtually takes back a third of the old Roman Empire with an understrength force and is then uh, recalled and blinded by his masters. I think they even bring him back once after they blind him because they can't figure something out because the, the eunuch that, that took over his job, I think his name was Nestor, screwed something up. You know, talk about totally getting screwed. Patton. Yeah. You know. Everybody in the military hated him, but they needed him that they wanted to win. You know? <laughs> and I mean, he, in, it's like if I don't know, it it it, it takes a lot of um, gumption too on his part, on Themistocles' part, when you're in the heat of this, you know, existential threat to you know basically um, threaten. The rest of the Greeks like, hey, if y'all don't get in line and help us out, we've had our city burn. We'll go ahead and just take our Tyrim uh, boats and our ships and go make another Athens. You know, fuck y'all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a badass because uh, he, he got the Spartans to get in line, um, at least to an extent. Well, they were uh, they were radically conservative. If, uh, that's not too much of an oxymoron. They, they, they were uh, they were strictly conservative. They just they were they were very tied to their uh, different religious obligations and everything. Yeah. So that, that would be a problematical ally. It's like, uh, you know, we can't fight. It's Sunday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. That, that's what that's what kind of people they were. But, you know, it contributed to their also their, their unique strengths. And I mean, when you let's go ahead and um, talk about a little bit um, about you said you said uh, I think we were off air when you said that uh, two of your favorite other savior generals are. Sherman and Bedford Forrest. Um, right, and they were yeah. enemies. Sherman put a price on Forrest's head, called him that devil, put $10,000 on his head, just one of them killed because he was causing him such a headache. Now, William Tecumseh Sherman, 
is named after Tecumseh. And he didn't call himself William T. Sherman, didn't call himself William Sherman. He was always William Tecumseh Sherman. So he was very proud of being named heir to this rebel Indian who led a pan-Indian alliance uh, against the, the United States. And they were then stabbed in the back by the British and hung out to dry uh, at a crucial battle. Now, uh, Sherman had problems with his sanity. You know, he was a person that was, you know, suffered horrible depressions, uh, would have spent his life under psychiatric care if he lived today had been heavily medicated probably most of his life. Uh, but he was also not that good in the peacetime military. But in war, he functioned very highly. So he seems to have been a case of somebody who is crazy, but when the world goes crazy, he's the perfect guy to deal with it. And he said from the beginning that he would, because he knew that, now, the guy that just got uh, got screwed out of uh, screwed out of the throne on the Potomac, okay, was the only president in U.S. history that was not either a military commander or a professional politician. He was an anomaly. Okay, will not happen again. I do not believe. But the uh, Sherman knew that the way, particularly. The guy he was named after, the defeat of Tecumseh, put two presidents in office. If you had anything to do with that campaign, you were headed to the White House. So he knew that war success in the United States was a sure route to the White House. When it was first mentioned, he said, I will never. I will never run for office and I will never accept nomination office ever. He knew he was unsuited for it. He's not a peacetime guy. Uh, he knew war was hell. He said that, and he uh, his job was to extinguish the flames he thrived in, uh, which makes him a pretty uniquely negating character. Uh, Hansen points out accurately that while Ulysses S. Grant got 100,000 poor white trash from urban cities killed in Virginia, going up against Bobby Lee, that Sherman killed a couple hundred folks in, uh, in the South that were not military combatants and burned a bunch of mansions and burned a factory and did terrorize the very elite Deep South people who pushed the border states into that war. Tennessee didn't want to secede from the Union. But they went to war against the Union when the Union invaded Tennessee to get to the Deep South. You know, Bobby Lee would not fight outside of the Army of Northern Virginia. He would not defend the West. He was only defending his state. He refused appointment elsewhere. He knew the war would be won in the West. And there was never a general after Shiloh that was elevated to the position of commander in the West that would have facilitated that. And he knew that. He was just fighting for the protection of his state and the honor of his state. Uh, the only way that the war in the West could have been won would have been if Nathan Bedford Forrest would have been left to command it with like-minded souls, and he was socially unacceptable. He could never... He started out as a private. He was not a war college graduate like Sherman. He, he, there was no possible way he could be... It was a miracle he became a major, major general, Okay. That was a miracle. There was no way after he threatens to slap Braxton Bragg, who was an idiot, that he's ever going to be a general because it was the Deep South people, uh, the people that owned uh, the most acreage, the most slaves, and uh, represented the smallest slice of the population that really pushed for something, that pushed for secession. Uh, so... Uh, Sherman went directly for those people. Uh, you know, he did not want to content himself with murdering every poor, you know, uh, Southern boy that could uh, be put barefoot out there with a rifle to fight the Union. You know, he went for the operational victory instead of what Grant was doing, which is just making Bobby Lee face the arithmetic. And he's just going to 
he doesn't care how many New Yorkers or how many Irishmen off the boat get ground up in this meat grinder. He's going to uh, he's going to win because that's the skill set he's got. You know, uh, Grant just doesn't give a shit about human beings. So so he's he's good with that. Uh, uh, Sherman was actually a more sensitive character. He didn't want to see more bloodshed than necessary. He knew the more terrible you made it, uh, the quicker people would get sick of it. And uh, he knew how important the forest was. And he put a price on his head like he was a criminal, even though he was a legitimate uh, enemy combatant. Because, again, if he could get rid of forest, he could loosen up a vast quantity of supplies and a lot of rear echelon troops for deeper garrison duty. Because of Forrest, he actually had to unhook from a supply line and do that daring march down to Atlanta in the city. Okay. Uh, because he just could never get rid of this asshole that was in his backfield. They're not, they weren't controlling uh, numbers of men that made them, uh, that made them viable combatants. I mean, the most men Forrest ever had under his command was 5,000. And Sherman could lay his hands on 10 times that, you know, so there was uh, the uh, forest essentially spent his entire four years defending Tennessee. You know, he, he fought some outside of that, but for the most part, he was again, he was defending his native state against uh, the northern aggressor and uh I think he had 34 horses shot out from underneath of him, was proud of the fact that he killed 35 enemy with his own hands, including close range pistol shots and sword thrusts. Uh, he was in about as many battles, about 35 battles, lost one of them, um, and uh, was the kind of guy that, uh, you know, uh, could have taken the West a lot more cleanly than Sherman and Sheridan did <laughs> uh, or could have defended the West if he was, uh, if he was an Indian and, you know, and, and could uh, lay his hand, hands on enough captured supplies. So he's kind of like a, a Tennessee crazy horse. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Forrest seems like a type of guy that was a, a born killer, but I mean, I, from what I know about him, it's like he, was he even that violent, before the war popped off okay. when he was 13 years old his father died mm -hmm. he had already become infamous in the neighborhood because as a 10 year old boy he stood up against two large hounds who could have torn him limb from limb but he stood up to the hounds that were ch that were that would go out there and chase people when he was 15 uh his mother and aunt were attacked by a panther he had a single shot muzzle loader he took his dog he went out in the woods by night and he stayed out there until he killed the panther when a neighbor threatened to kill uh there was a dispute with a cow either his cow was breaking down a neighbor's fence or the neighbor's cow was breaking down his mother's fence the neighbor threatened the forest family and little nathan threatened the neighbor who was a grown man and the neighbor knew better so uh, neighbor Nathan was known as a stand up guy. So a man that was involved in the slave trade, which meant that other slave traders were looking to kill you. OK, in Tennessee enlisted him as a business partner. And Nathan didn't have anything to put up but his balls. Okay? So four men ambushed him. His partner is gunned down. Nathan guns down one of these guys, wings another one. And then with only a Bowie knife in front of the whole town, he charges the last two guys that still have guns and they run away. So his reputation is made. This guy's a badass. Yeah. Okay. First gunfight, lays two guys out. And even after his gun is empty, he's coming after you with a knife. Okay. So he's 5'10, 5'11, 180 pounds. <laughs> Not uh, brilliant mechanically. He loved to wrestle. He was extremely strong. He was fearless. He had problems with anger. Uh, he had uh, he uh, he had a really hard time with people who mistreated their hounds, their horses, or their negroes. Okay, 
he went into the slave trading business uh, because he saw that if you advertise the fact that you treated your human property humanely and you advertise the fact that you fed them well and you did not beat them and you would promise to take them back if they misbehave, that uh, you could make a lot of money in the slave trade, which is the trade that he basically walked into working as his uncle's bodyguard. Okay. Do you have any anecdotes about uh, him, uh, like uh, fighting somebody because they mistreated their hounds <laughs> or dogs? Is that like did? He, so like, I wonder if there's any stories about him uh, fighting somebody over a dog. No, I don't. I, yeah. I don't. I don't recall that. Yeah, uh, he did. Uh, he did kill a guy with a pen knife who had shot him. And yeah. then apologized to the guy for that. That was on a point of honor. Uh, he did beat some uh, some Confederate soldiers that were doing something wrong. Yeah. Uh, one at, at at one point, there was uh, uh, he had a famous horse named King Philip uh, that actually uh, hated men in blue so much that when he was being used to carry a funeral casket on a carriage, he saw a bunch of police cadets drilling in the street and he charged that. Okay. So that's how, yeah, that's how loyal this, this horse was. He had, uh, he freed all of his slaves. He had been planning on divesting himself from the slave business because he considered it dishonorable. And, uh, this is something that nobody will talk about right now. Like okay, if they no. hear, yeah, forced, they just immediately think awful. He, yeah. he had ten. He had ten African American men in his personal bodyguard that served as troopers. When he freed his fifty-one slaves, one of them went north, and the other fifty either served with him as soldiers, or they continued to work for him for pay. He went to trial for murder again and stood before a mixed race jury for the crime of defending an African American woman against an African American man who was beating him to death. And at this point, he was an old man, and the young man was much larger than him. And Nathan beat him to death with an axe handle. And then, when the man, when the wife beater's friends came to settle the score, Old Nathan came out in the yard with his six gun and said, I'm here to settle it. And they all went home. He turned himself in uh, for trial and he was acquitted by a mixed race jury. He floated a plan to buy African slaves. This was after the Civil War because there so many men in the South have been killed. He floated a plan to buy African slaves, give them their freedom, bring them to America and pay them a fair wage for work. Everybody thought he was nuts, so it didn't happen. And maybe he was nuts. He did. He's re, he's regarded as the person that founded the Ku Klux Klan, but he did not. He disbanded the Ku Klux Klan. Um, why is he? Um, why? Yeah. Why is why is he connected with founding okay. the Ku Klux Klan? Okay. So there's three iterations of the Ku Klux Klan. There's the current FBI front group. Okay. <laughs> That's what they are. They're all FBI agents. Yeah. There is the second iteration of the Klan, which was all about getting rid of and terrorizing African American people, which is the Klan that we think of. Yeah. There was the first iteration of the Klan, which was founded by four men, which included his one time co commander and subordinate, a good Confederate colonel named Chalmers who, along with Nathan, saved a bunch of Negroes from a massacre, okay, at, at uh, Fort Pillow. We, we can get to that later. Now, he, uh, he and these other three guys had been dealing with Reconstruction in Tennessee. The governor of Tennessee had actually declared that every man that had fought for the Confederacy in Tennessee, because not all of them had, Tennessee split. One third of the men went for the Union. Two thirds of the men went for the South. Before the Civil War, when it came to secession, Tennessee voted against secession. But then 
not, but then even though Tennessee did not vote to secede, when Lincoln declared that he was invading Tennessee, two thirds of Tennesseans voted to go with the Confederacy and fight the North because they didn't want to be invaded. They did not appreciate that. So it, it was obviously a ploy by the Union just to drag them into the war so that they can gobble them up and use them as a supply head because of the river system and everything. But uh, so at the end of the war, the carpetbaggers come down and the loyalist Tennesseans, the Union loyalists, uh, they gain control. The governor declares that they're actually going to kill all of the native Tennesseans that fought for the Confederacy. So the Ku Klux Klan is raised as an organization to defend white Tennesseans against white Tennesseans. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Then Forrest is brought in. Once Forrest is brought in, well, you're looking at possibly another civil war because the North is still terrified of this guy. They had wanted him to be court-martialed. But this is the guy that didn't lose. So, and he's got the moral authority. So he told uh, people in Washington, said, I can raise 40,000 men and they'll be hell to pay. So call your dogs off. Do not allow your men in Tennessee to slaughter their fellow Tennesseans. Now, while this is happening, chapters of this start sprouting up all over the South. And during Reconstruction, there was uh, people from the North had had inflamed a lot of racial animosity in the South. They were, for instance, disarming Caucasians and arming Africans and redistributing things. Okay, a lot of African Americans and Caucasian Americans were getting along just fine after the Civil War, but there were troublemakers from the North. And there were some troublemakers in the South, and there were problems. So then the KKK starts going after black people in other states, and Nathan uh, didn't like that. He had a history of getting along very good with colored folk. He would routinely have barbecues with them and ask them what they needed, and then he would make sure they got what they needed, and he treated them with respect, and he respected them. So he told me, and he also didn't like the outfits. He thought it was humiliating. So he said, put the funny costumes away and leave the colored folk alone and go home. Okay. So that was the end of it. He he didn't start it. He disbanded it. And he also did not organize the slaughter of uh, African-American troops at Fort Pillow. What happened was, is African-American troops have been sent against his troops wearing no quarter badges that had been knitted for them and put on their vests in hope of causing a Confederate slaughter of the African-American troops who were announcing that they were not going to take Confederate prisoners and that they were going to murder the Confederates after they surrendered by wearing this badge. The African-Americans were being used by the North in this unfortunate manner in order to incite a war crime to get more support from Great Britain for the Union War effort. So uh, once they take Fort Pillow against white and black troops, with white and black troops, uh, Forrest has black troops with them, Forrest sees that there's a whole riverboat of Yankee reinforcements that are going to be landed, and he already took a place that outnumbered him by like three to one. He was already in a shit situation. So... He was always fascinated by artillery and didn't know how to use it. So he goes up to this turret to where this gun is, and he's trying to figure out how to use this thing, okay, with the assistance of one of his artillerymen. uh, And he's obsessed with trying to blow this this transport boat out of the water. Meanwhile, uh, the his Tennessee troops were slaughtering their white Tennessee enemies. Because these guys have been raping their wives and their sisters and their mothers. Okay? Because the Confederates were out of town and the Union Tennesseans were in town and they had access to the women of the rebel Confederates. And that's where the start the, the slaughter starts there, these grudges, and then you got all these black guys wearing no quarter patches. So the good old boys start killing some of them too, because they were going to kill them. So turnabout was fair play. 
And Chalmers sees this and he's horrified. He's a West Point graduate. He's not going to have this happen on his watch. And he sends somebody to notify Forrest and him and Forrest stop the massacre before it goes too far. Some of them do get killed. All right. So Forrest then writes a letter to his union counterpart across the river. And he said, in so many words, you should be ashamed about how you're treating these these Negro soldiers. You should not be putting those no, no quarter badges on them. And you should be treating them fairly and not using them for these dastardly purposes. You know, so he was he was a man of honor. And, uh, you know, to my knowledge, he only slew two African-Americans. One of them is a man who tried to kill him in a battle. He was a Union soldier. And Nathan let him shoot first. And then when the man missed, he shot him dead. And then the other guy was the buck that he killed with the axe handle when he was an old man. You know, so and, and yet you got to dig up his body and his wife's body because he was supposedly somebody that hated African-Americans when he was essentially their advocate, even when he was a slave trader. Yeah, I mean, if you know. I mean, I guess it was just at some point in the history, I guess, uh, around the civil rights movement, he probably someone decided to use him as a. You know, to revise history and make him into a, a scapegoat and whatever. Well, you, you see his picture and you can't find guilt anywhere there. And guilt is the complexion we are supposed to wear. Okay. As, yeah. Yeah. As survivors of uh, of this uh, misbegotten country. So yeah, he fits the bill as, as, as the villain. Now, from Sherman's point of view, people like Forrest were horrible because... Why did Sherman think people like Forrest and why did people, the men, the free soil men under Sherman, think people like Forrest are horrible? Because Forrest was, according to them, a lover of African-Americans because he spread them with his economy, with his plantations, with his slave trading. And they denied, they denied work to European-American men. So the troops that came from Ohio Indiana, Illinois, and Kansas were men and the sons of men and the grandsons of men who had all been driven from Virginia farms way back when because of the slave economy. You can't, you can't run a family farm down the road from Wade Hampton, who owns 200 slaves. Because you cannot compete with him. And on top of that, since Wade Hampton owns more than 10 slaves, he doesn't have to go on slave catcher patrol. And you do in the middle of the night to protect your property because Wade doesn't lock up his slaves because they don't rob his stuff. They rob your stuff. And you know what? If you're an African slave that's stuck on a plantation, you don't get paid for your work. And there's some poor white people that live down the road to have some stuff. Why not go rob them? After all, it's white people that own you. Okay, so this dynamic of unsecured slaves who basically, through crime in the middle of the night, drive away the surrounding people, that opens up cheap land for their owner to buy. And it also suppresses the wage economy, means that young men can't get wage earning jobs, and they have to go west. So the Free Soil Act, uh, uh, the Free Soil Party is totally unheard of, but it's about not spreading slavery, which to them meant not spreading Africans because the Africans were the group of people that stayed in slavery the longest. Uh, the groups of people before them fought so hard against it that they ran away in such numbers and they staged so many bloody uprisings that eventually nobody tried to stop them. And uh, uh, rewards for runaway white boys by 1820 were down to six cents from five dollars in 2000 in, in 1812. 1812, five for a runaway Caucasian. 1820, six cents. It was no longer worth it. OK, so. The, the residual slave economy now rested with the African-Americans and they were seen as part of the problem because 
they were the hands that did the work that put that put the free people out of work. Okay, and their owners were seen as people who liked them. And part of that dynamic comes from the plantation era, which we can talk about at a, at a different time. But Sherman sees Forrest as partially being a bad person because he is promoting the African-American slave economy at the expense of the free Anglo-American homestead economy. And it turns out that Sherman's army wins that battle because he's got more men, because they're the grandsons of the men who couldn't make a living in the Confederacy that had to move into the Ohio Valley. Uh, to make a living to get away from the slave economy, which basically sets the stage for the victory of the Union because they have the larger number of uh, free men with a stake in society and a gun to go fight the war. You know, so um, uh, that's that, that's a history of the Confederacy that you're not going <laughs> to. Uh, it's probably not legal uh, to, to, to even discuss, but. Uh, you, you can check all the store sources. So the uh, two biographies on for a look at Sherman, I'd suggest Victor Davis Hanson, Saver Generals, the two biographies of Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, a battle from the start by Nathan Steele, uh, uh, by Brian Steele Wills and bust hell wide open by an author. I cannot re recall the name of. They're both excellent and they do not retrace a lot of the same ground. The second author tried not to step on Steel Will's work that much, and instead complimented it and did an excellent job. Uh, there's another character from this period, uh, Captain Jack Hansen, who is said killed up to 100 men as a sniper with a specially made rifle uh, after he was a friend not only of Nathan Bedford Forrest, but of Ulysses S. Grant. Dang. And he stayed neutral in the war. But... Someone Junior, killed a kid, right, or something. They beheaded both of his sons and put their heads. The Union soldiers did this, not by Grant's orders. It was a lower-down guy. Placed both their heads on his fence post of his gate to his front yard. So then he declared a personal war on the Union. He even captured a riverboat by himself, a, a gunboat, a, a, a ship of war. And... Uh, one of the things he spent a great deal of time doing was protecting the Black Hinsons. They were the former slaves of his family who he had freed. And he willed all of his property to them. And they put him up when he was doing his sniping duties. They'd bring him food. They'd let him come by for a rest. And then Captain Jack Hinson found out that the Union troops were abusing the Black Hinsons, who, after all, were his relatives because these people interbred, okay? It was a high-status thing for the African-American woman to be impregnated by her owner, okay? I mean, so it was, it was sometimes rape. It was not necessarily always rape. But in any, in any case, they're blood relatives. So Captain Jack Henson actually wipes out and hunts, hunts down and wipes out the Union patrols who are raping his, his African-American female relatives, and he's a Caucasian American. And there are also criminal gangs that are not Union and are not Confederate that are preying on the Black Hensons and they're, they're preying on Union soldiers and they're preying on Confederate soldiers and civilians. And he hunted them to extinction by himself. He knew that it was the, the land he grew up in. He never went outside of the county of his birth, I believe. Uh, hmm. And... Once he had killed enough, he took his gun to Nathan Bedford Forrest and and walked away. So I'm done. Oh, he's one of those guys that, you know, walked and did his killing and then. And walked away. And he was eventually murdered, I believe. Damn. By some other white southerner. Okay. Did it have any, do you know if it had anything to I, do with like a vendetta? It's been like two years since I read the book. Uh, mm. I, for, uh, I forget. Uh, but. He wasn't apparently at any fault. He seemed to be a completely stand-up guy that didn't yeah. even want to get involved in the war. You know, he, yeah. subject to a tragedy, he protected all the people he could. He let, uh, instead of continuing to shoot the Union sailors and soldiers on this river gunboat, he let them surrender to him 
And even though he was not in a position to take control of the boat, he let them sail away under their own power. Okay. Yeah. So he was a humane guy. He was an honorable guy, but he was another guy in Tennessee that was put in the middle of this situation uh, that they didn't want to be in. And at a certain point, they end up protecting African American people from yeah. Anglo American Northerners. <laughs> God. Okay. Yeah, you know, but you can't hear that. Yeah, it's like a terrible it. situation though, because you got like bushwhackers or or whatever you want to call them, uh, bandits. You know, in the middle of the Civil War, plus you know, yeah, opposing, yeah, opposing forces and so. Um, it's uh, you know, somebody is, like. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Like, how I was gonna say, like, to kind of um, close up a little bit, like, how I wanted to know, and I'm sure the audience wants to know if they don't know. Um, does how does does Sherman and Forrest have a uh, decent death? <laughs> do they live to be like? Do they die horribly, or do they kind of just get old and die? <laughs> uh, Forrest was shot a few times. Okay. He had a he had a, a mini ball permanently lodged next to his spine. Mm. Uh, he spent when he was around forty years. He spent four years in the saddle fighting sword fights, uh, get, getting shot, being out in the cold, uh, and he died in terrible pain and misery. Okay, he was relatively dynamic until his last few years. One time he was even on a train full of Union soldiers at the rail and he took command of the Union soldiers and made them, uh, you know, repair the tracks, which were the his troops used to tear up Union tracks. And it, so he actually he's actually repairing a train wreck of the, of the kind that he used to be in the business of causing. Uh, <laughs> he uh, so, yeah, he, he died a terrible death. His mm. uh, his great grandson was killed uh, piloting, I think, a, uh, a B-17 over uh, Germany or Holland. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Wehrmacht shot him down, and I believe they, they held a military funeral for him because they knew who he was. He was a general. I think it was a Brigadier General Nathan Bedford Forrest Jr., but he was like the grandson or great-grandson of Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, I'm... Uh, currently writing a alternate history uh, uh, novel in which the South won the Civil War and there is an expeditionary force of Confederates fighting in Operation Barbarossa under General George S. Patton and Nathan Bedford Forrest Jr. Okay. Uh, so that's probably, uh, th that book should get banned. Uh, now, it's, it's titled Rebel Nell, K N. E L L. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, it's a chance. And, and, and also, uh, the captain of, uh, the troop of, uh, African American Confederate soldiers is none other than Jesse Owens. <laughs> it's called, uh, the, the Bantu hand grenade. Okay. The T 34s cannot outrun him when he's got a satchel charge. So, anyhow, uh, the, uh, <laughs> That, that'll get me in trouble sometime this year. But the uh, Sherman, I do not know how Sherman died. I believe somebody died carrying his casket at a funeral because they refused to wear their hat in the rain. Uh, and I don't know what circumstances he died under. Uh, Grant died of tongue cancer and managed to get enough residual money for his family to live on by writing his biography which was one of the few noble things he did. Well, uh, like, um, uh, Sherman lived to be um, 71. He died in and, so That's good. <laughs> now, Sherman, uh, Sherman did command, I think, the Department of the Interior. Uh, and the man under him was General Sheridan, the psychopathic Irish-American prick, who's the guy that, would have basically been the Union Nathan Bedford Forrest. And the man that fought under Sheridan during the Civil War and many bloody engagements was General George Armstrong C Custer. So you know what ended up happening to him. Uh, Custer, uh, Custer was the rival of a guy named uh, John Singleton Mosby, who was a, 
a, a Shenandoah Valley uh, partisan commander of uh, late irregular course. But a- anyhow, he was fighting against Sheridan's command. Custer was under Sheridan in the Civil War in the Shenandoah and also in the far west. And so when Custer gets slaughtered, he's actually technically a couple tiers down under Sheridan's command and Sheridan is under Sherman. So Sherman actually ends up supervising the, uh, uh, the, the defeat of the Native Americans, <laughs> uh, the Lakota particularly, and that uh, earlier on before the Civil War, Sheridan refused to put to take military action against the ever vigilant army uh, that uh, that basically lynched the murderers in San Francisco while they locked up the corrupt police and the corrupt politicians. Uh, Sherman, oh, yeah, that's, probably, awesome. that's probably the most noble thing he never he ever did was he refused to side with the corrupt governor, mayor, and police uh, commissioner in San Francisco, and he let the vigilant army take care of it because many of those men had been American veterans who had defeated the Mexican forces in 1848 in conquering California and taking it from, from the Mexicans. Was he just out there as like, as part of being the department? He had a, he had a post with, I think yeah. it was the department of the interior and he was the man on the scene and he should have, you know, the governor called upon him to do his duty and take command. Yeah. And then he said that he could not honorably do so because you the situation think, was so bad. I mean, he was pretty popular though too, right? I mean, uh, among he wasn't popular other. with his commanders. Other than Grant, Sherman was not popular with his commanders. Uh, so he had a lot of similarities with Patton. He had he had problems with his sanity. Yeah, yeah. Him and Grant both had problems with alcohol. Weren't they like uh, failed businessmen too in different capacities before the war? Yes. yes. Yeah. So they had a real hard time with non-wartime activity but they were excellent in wartime and you know what grant's not as nearly as noble a character as sherman but in a lot of ways he was the guy that permitted sherman to do what sherman needed to do yeah he at least recognized talent in that capacity i guess uh to give him the freedom to yeah and win the war i guess but there was the thing that you know there's the guy that can kill the guy okay yeah yeah and then there's and then there's the guy that can't. Well, then there's the guy that can send men to their death, <laughs> knowing that they're going to die, and the yeah. guy that can't, and the guy that has a hard time with it. Grant was the guy that had no problem sending tens of thousands of young men to their death, knowing that they were just there to soak up enemy lead. I think that's worse than the uh, townspeople in High Plains Drifter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. So, like they're both so bad. The characters. <laughs> But Forrest, Forrest had to lead men. He couldn't just send them in. Sherman could not stomach his men taking high casualties. Yeah. So he chose maneuver. Yeah. Uh, Grant did to a certain extent in the West. Okay. Uh, that, but it was it was easier to do. Uh, the uh, Robert E. Lee is a character that does not want to lose any more men than he has to and it hurts him every time his men get killed and they know it and tragically it kind of makes them fight even harder and get killed at a higher rate you yeah, know and it, it seems how much like they loved him yeah really, you know so it um, seems like that really ate him up yeah yeah man it, well i think that's a good place to end um so we've We've answered some audience questions earlier, and we went straight through uh, to give you all some examples of some generals that and leaders um, that, uh, by their own people in a lot of ways, um, just were not. It, I just I keep thinking about um, uh, I keep thinking about High Plains Drifter <laughs> and and having oh. to take care of people that uh despise you or despise you for uh what you have to do um Father, uh, before i forget nathan bedford forrest was the primary basis for the fantasy character conan the barbarian 
Oh, really? The author, Robert E. Howard, his uncle rode under farms. His family came from Mississippi. He wrote in East Texas, but uh, the generation before him were Mississippians. And he wrote a very touching Civil War story named For the Love of Barbara Allen. And uh, he his descriptions of uh, of Forrest in that are almost identical to some of the descriptions of the Conan character. Plus, he uh, uh, the uh, uh, the mountain uh, the, the rural southern mountain upbringing uh, w- was really the basis that the misty uh, mountains around. Tennessee and Arkansas is kind of the basis for the fantasy land of Samaria, which is the place where uh, Conan's race tribe of barbarians supposedly came from. Uh, the, the, you know, they were mountain barbarians. Uh, and it was somewhat conflated in the idea of like, uh, you know, the Irish and Scottish fighting men, the, the Gales, uh, which, uh, when it, you know, in terms of lineage, they were. These people could trace their lineage back to uh uh, Irish, Scotch, and Scotch-Irish people. So that uh, that probably most famous fantasy character is uh, at the core based on that character of Nathan Bedford Forrest with a bunch of uh, people that Howard knew when he was an accountant. His uncle was a half-breed Indian. His uh, He knew his father was a, a doctor that treated uh, like oil field ruck, roughnecks for their injuries and stuff. So he's a mixture of some different adventurous types of people, you know, uh, so, I uh, yeah, I never, I didn't, yeah, I would have never guessed it. And his <laughs> I mean, his character, I mean, Solomon Kane is yeah. based on his father, uh, uh, his, was based on Robert E. Howard's father, who was a, a, a Bible thumping doctor that dressed in black a lot and wore a black hat and uh, the Virginia pioneer, Captain John Smith, who also fought the Turks in Eastern Europe and was once held as a slave of the Ottoman Turk, as was the character uh, Solomon Kane. So John uh, Smith was a slave before by the Ottoman Turks. Yeah, he was held for a while. He claims Mm -hmm. that he claims that the affection of uh, one of the women in the uh, in the harem uh, mm-hmm. resulted in, in him being uh, uh, released to sneak out. Yes, yeah, so that was uh, John Smith was a totally interesting guy. He was also, like you said, the enforcer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like he he also sold one of his boys right off the bat. Like yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what else you gonna do with a boy? Boy means slave. Okay. But it, this guy wasn't. This little kid wasn't his, his blood, was he? And not that it really mattered. No. Makes it that much no. better. He was just a. He was, was just a, a random. Uh, he, he had a name. I can't remember his name. Uh, he was. Uh, he was sold to Powhatan. Yeah. And Powhatan, as most Indians did, released him and adopted him, and was later offended when the, the boy left, because he had tr- he had treated him so well. He's like, you're my son. Uh, yeah. Why would you leave? Uh, but the, he was one of those rare cases of uh, an, uh, an Anglo-American boy who lived with the Indians and decided not to stay with the Indians. Most of them just <laughs> yeah. decided to stay with the Indians. Because and I would have pick to- his brain, man. I would. Uh, how awesome would it be to have a journal from that kid? Man. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's been good talking to you, James, and I uh, look forward to talking to you again. Uh Everybody uh, listening, thank you for listening. And uh, is there any closing things that you would like to say? Well, I'd just like to thank you and uh, your your listeners for the for their questions. It helps. You never know when uh, you missed a detail. Like I didn't cite Grossman's book, for instance, yeah. uh, when we talked last time. So that's always helpful quite a bit. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, this is Rusty with Rusty Vignettes and James LaFon. Until next time, uh, take care, and I'll uh, talk to you all later. <laughs>